Welcome to the organic chemistry section of our practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 31 to 35. So first, I'll show you guys a question so you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 31, 32, 33, 34, and 35. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 31, it says four compounds undergo paper chromatography with an RF distribution as follows. So D is greater than C, which is greater than B, which is greater than A. Which of the following is the most polar molecule? So here we're talking about paper chromatography, so TLC, and then we're asking which one is the most polar. So in TLC, the basic one, how it works, is silica, which is polar, is our stationary phase, and all of the different molecules are spotted on it. And then they bind to silica to some extent, and then we have a mobile phase which runs through the TLC, and that's usually nonpolar. So unless it's specified that it's a different type of polarity, like reverse polarity, you can just assume that the stationary one is polar and the mobile one is nonpolar. So that means that the one which most adheres to the nonpolar mobile phase is going to stick to that liquid and travel up the furthest on our paper chromatography, and then it's going to have the highest RF. So as RF increases, we have a nonpolar molecule, and then if you have a small RF, it is more polar. So in this case, we're asked which one is the most polar. So that would be the one with the smallest RF. So RF tells us how far the spot for our molecule traveled on the TLC compared to how far the, mo the, the solvent front went. So the one which has the highest RF traveled the furthest, the one which traveled the least has the lowest RF and it's the most polar because it didn't travel a lot because it's stuck to the polar stationary phase. So in this case, A is our correct answer. In question 32, it says polyglycine is a polypeptide composed of a string of glycine residues. It is a model polypeptide for many of its properties since glycine is the simplest amino acid. Compared to polyarginine compa compare, sorry, composed of 20 residues, one can expect polyglycine composed of 20 residues to blank. So we have a polypeptide, a peptide made up of many different amino acids. So we have 20 residue chains and we have one that is made up of glycine, so polyglycine, and then we have polyarginine. We're just asked to compare the two of these. And for glycine, you should know that the R group is simply a hydrogen molecule, whereas for arginine, it's this entire group. So there's a bunch of carbons, and then we have that, that guanine group at the end, which is those three nitrogens. So because of the three nitrogens, arginine is known to be a basic amino acid, and then because it's basic, that means that it has a high pK. So compared to polyarginine, we're going to say polyglycine has this, but not other things. So does polyglycine have a wider range of torsional angles due to decreased steric hindrance? Yes, that is correct. Or that is the correct answer, actually. A is correct. Polyglycine just has an H as its R group, whereas arginine has all those carbons and those nitrogens. That means there's a lot more steric hindrance in the side chain group for arginine. And so when we have this polypeptide, steric hindrance is reducing the amount of torsional angles which this, this polypeptide can undergo. But for glycine, it has a small R group and therefore less steric hindrance. So it's not as restricted in the different angles that it can take. So A is correct. B is saying that polyglycine will have a higher effective pKa. That's incorrect because pKa is high if you have a basic residue and arginine is basic, whereas glycine is not. C, it will form a more basic solution. That's pretty much the same thing as B, and so incorrect. D is saying it will have a higher molecular weight. That's incorrect. We have one small H group as our side chain, and arginine has a lot more carbons with different hydrogens on them and the nitrogens, so it's definitely going to have a higher molecular weight. So A is the correct answer here. In question 33, we're asked which of the following molecules will have the highest boiling point. So highest boiling point. Usually for this, for the MCAT, you try to look for anything that has the possibility of having hydrogen bonds. And a key molecule which forms hydrogen bonds, a key atom, is oxygen. So oxygen connected to a hydrogen, it will form a lot of hydrogen bonds. And then also we look out for van der Waals forces as well. So long carbon chains as well can lead to a lot of intermolecular forces which have to be broken between 
that solution of the molecule before it can go into the gas phase. So option A, it has three carbons, so it will have a decent amount of van der Waals forces. B has nitrogen, so it can it has only one carbon, but it can have hydrogen bonding with the nitrogen, and that's good. But C is the best answer because of that oxygen and that hydrogen, which will have hydrogen bonding to a greater extent than option B. And then we can eliminate A because it does not have hydrogen bonding, and hydrogen bonding is much more significant than just having van der Waals. Although if two things do have hydrogen bonding, then you can differentiate based on which one has more van der Waals. And finally, D. D, it's also good because this molecule has some polarity in it. So since it has, a, it has some dipole, if it has a dipole moment, you should think about like the 3D structure and if it doesn't cancel out, but this one does have a dipole moment. So based on the dipole, that's increased intermolecular attractions and that can lead to a higher boiling point, but it's not as significant as hydrogen bonding. So option C is the best. Question 34 is saying methane thiol, which is this carbon attached to one sulfur, has a pK of 10.3, and methanol, which has the oxygen instead of sulfur, has a pK of 15.5, which is a stronger acid, which is a stronger base. And then we're given their, their conjugate forms, so when they're deprotonated. So for this, you should know that if something has a high Ka, that's a constant equilibrium constant for its acid dissociation, so how much it dissociates into an acid and loses its proton. If Ka is high, that means it's a good acid, but then pKa, which is the negative log of the Ka, it should be low for something to be a good acid. So a low pKa means a strong acid. And between these two, this one has a lower pKa, so it is relatively a stronger acid, whereas the methanol has a pKa of 15.5, so it is the stronger base, right? So whichever one has a lower pKa is a stronger acid, and whichever one has a higher pKa is a stronger base. And then you also need to keep in mind about con things about conjugate acids and bases. So if something is an acid, then when it's deprotonated, it has a molecule formed, which is the negatively charged deprotonated form of it, which now is a conjugate base because this molecule can grab a proton and go back to the acid form. And if you have a strong acid, that is going to lead to a weak base. And then if you have a like strong base, it leads to a weak acid. And then if they're medium-ish, then they're going to also be a medium base. So a medium acid will give you a medium type conjugate base as well. So in the case of the numbers that we have here, 10.3, we're talking about this as an acid. It's not the lowest pK, so something like HCl would be a much stronger acid, and it has a pK around like 4 or something. So actually, it's, it's lower than even 4. Acetic acid, which is a mild acid, has a pK around 4, and then when that is deprotonated, it has a mild conjugate base as well. So what I'm trying to say is that for the methane thiol, it has a high pK, like it has a relatively lower pK, which means it's a better acid than methanol, but its pK isn't so low that we could call it an actual strong acid. And so its conjugate base is probably not going to be like a, a weak conjugate base. It's a mild acid, and so its conjugate base is going to be a mild conjugate base as well. So our correct answer in this question is actually A. It's saying that methane thiol is a stronger acid, which is correct. And then its conjugate base is the stronger base. And then, yeah, that's that's correct for both of the statements. It's the stronger acid because it has a lower pKa compared to methanol. And then because it's a stronger acid, its conjugate form is going to be the stronger base. Option B is saying methanol is a stronger acid. And because of this, it's incorrect. Option C is saying methane thiol is a stronger acid, but now saying methanol's conjugate base is the stronger base. And because of that second part, it's incorrect. Because if methanol is the stronger base itself, then its conjugate base is going to do the opposite thing, and it's going to be a conjugate acid, not a conjugate base. And then D is also incorrect because it's saying methanol is a stronger acid.
Moving on to question 35, it says each carbon in ethyne has how many sigma bonds? So ethyne looks like this. Eth tells us that there are two carbons. And then the ine part tells us that there is a triple bond in between the two carbons. And you should know that every single bond that happens between two atoms in a molecule is first of all a sigma bond, and then any additional bonds are pi bonds. So over here, we sorry, that would be a sigma bond. Over here, we have a sigma bond between carbon and hydrogen. Over here, we have another sigma bond, which is that first bond I formed. But then that next bond, which was a double bond, is a pi bond. And then a triple bond is another pi bond. And then we have another sigma bond over here. So we're asked in ethyne how many sigma bonds. And then we're asked for each carbon. So overall, the molecule we can say has three sigma bonds, but for each carbon, it has one sigma bond, which is happening between the two carbons, and then it has another sigma bond between the other hydrogen that it's bonded to. So two is the correct answer here, and that's it for this question. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is in the description below. In that course, we go through a lot more questions and then go through all the different answers, explaining why each answer option is right or wrong. And other than that, make sure to subscribe to this channel so that you can check out all the videos that we post here. That's it for this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.